Thus far, uh, as in our study of gratitude, I've compared uh, the historical, personal, and biblical approaches to thanksgiving, uh, but there's one perspective that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is the gastronomical approach, right? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, for some people, Thanksgiving is all about the food. And I mean, you know how it is. We, we enjoy our turkey and stuffing or mashed potatoes and gravy or green bean casserole, pumpkin pie, apple pie, whatever it is. You know, we, we have those things that we associate with Thanksgiving. But of course, uh, you know, if you only associate gratitude and Thanksgiving with food, Food, you're going to have a problem when you get to the New Testament and it says to give thanks always, right? Because if you always eat that way, it's just not going to be a, a, healthy, <laughs> a healthy thing. Um, but we've seen that the biblical approach uh, to gratitude is to focus on God's character and his works. Uh, and you may remember last week we talked about this refrain that men that's mentioned nine times uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, Psalm 118.1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And we saw that when we track those attributes, goodness and steadfast love, through the book of Psalms, that we can sum it up as, as we see the different plot points in the biblical storyline. And, and I realize, if, if you heard that message last week, that it wasn't the most memorable outline. And so I, 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 I thought about it this week, and I tried to create an acronym for you, okay? Um, it's, it's a little silly, I'll admit, but, but if it helps you remember, it's okay. My acronym uh, for gratitude is CRISPY. CRISPY. <laughs> C is for creation. R, relation. I, instruction. S, salvation. P, protection. And E, eternity. Now, that should help you because... The tastiest parts of your Thanksgiving meal are often the crispy parts, right? I mean, it's the, it's the skin on your turkey, maybe. Maybe that's what you like, or the deep-fried onions on your green bean casserole, or, or maybe it's your pie crust, right? That buttery, flaky pie crust. Um, and those are typically the least healthy parts, right? The crispy parts. But here's the great thing. The crispy truths of biblical gratitude you can have those all the time, all the time. Uh, and so we celebrate that God, all that God's made in creation, right? Both uh, the heavens and the earth, and, and even we talked about him making us as, as individuals, creating us in the womb. Um, and we can celebrate his, his pursuit of a covenant relationship with us. That's the R, right? The instruction that he's given us in his word to guide us through life and the forgiveness of sins that we have in salvation. And even in the hardest times, we can be thankful still that he's protecting us, like Chris was talking about earlier, and that he's going to ensure that we make our way to this eternity, this new heaven and earth, where there'll be thanksgiving forever. Right? So biblical gratitude is fueled by a diet of crispiness. You can think of it that way. So, how then do we develop an appetite for those truths? Um, because so often we focus on other things, right? And just like you might do on Thanksgiving Day, you might get up and try to go for a walk to prepare for that meal. Uh, in a spiritual sense, you need exercise too. Now, the New Testament, like we've talked about, it commands us to give thanks always for everything in whatever you say or do, in all circumstances, and even for all people, right? And we've, so we've concluded that it requires discipline. And from looking at the Psalms again, I've, I've noticed that they demonstrate four exercises for developing biblical gratitude as a passionate habit. Right? It's, it's a habit. It's something we need to do consistently, but it's also something that's supposed to be, we should be passionate about. And so as we work through this spiritual training plan, I want to encourage you to consider how you can integrate these 
exercises into your life and continue to grow in them. And the first one, the place to start, is the exercise of biblical meditation. Now, if you're looking for an example of exercise and discipline, you probably wouldn't select the cow, right? Because all they do is, is stand around and, and eat, right? Or to be more exact, it, it chews. Uh, I mean, even when it's not grazing, its digestive system requires it to just keep chewing its cud. Uh, it said, I read this week that cows chew 50 times a minute for around 14 hours a day. <laughs> Now, of course, the cow does that, right, as a matter of instinct and survival. That's just how they need to live. It's not a matter of choice and discipline. But it still serves as a good illustration for how we as believers should approach biblical truth. We need to, to keep chewing on it all the time, right? And, and, and that's what biblical meditation is. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 2, says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Now, I know that word meditation in, in our culture today, you may have heard it, you know, someone talking about uh, yoga or in a context of hinduism or something where it's all about emptying your mind but when the bible uses that term here it's it's exactly the opposite it's to to focus your mind on god and his word and so it it starts with reading the bible with studying it with maybe memorizing key passages and listening to good good bible teaching but those activities are are relatively brief to meditate day and night, it means you continue to think through what you've heard. You continue to process, to think about how it applies to your life. And yet, you still might ask, is, is day and night, is that an exaggeration? How is it really possible to meditate all the time when you have so many other things to do? Well, some activities don't require your full attention, right? I mean, you can... Uh, you can Take advantage of those moments to direct your thoughts to, to biblical truths and, and to think about those things. And even when you are occupied with something that requires your full attention, I think the idea is that God's truth should still be the lens through which we look at life. Right? That is always there in the background as, we're, as we uh, go through our day. So what does that have to do with gratitude? It doesn't mention thanksgiving explicitly here in psalm 1 but it does talk about blessing right blessed is this person who meditates day and night and so there's there's a practical benefit on one side when we focus on god's word then it helps you resist temptation i think that's what verse 1 is talking about right as you obey god then there's just there is a you avoid the natural consequences of sin so there's a blessing in that sense. But thinking about God's truth also has a more direct and immediate spiritual benefit. We see that there when it talks about delighting in the law of the Lord. And we find that same kind of mindset in Psalm 119. The author of that psalm says, I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. Now, interestingly, the Hebrew word translated praise here is the same one that is used to speak of giving thanks in other passages. So you could say the psalmist was thanking God for what he was learning. He was grateful for the impact it was having on his heart. And so when you accept the word, then the wisdom of God's commands should be delightful. Right? David talks about that in Psalm 19, and of course, all of Psalm 119 really celebrates that. But biblical meditation is not just about learning the commandments of, of the law. In Psalm 9, David expressed it this way, verses 1 and 2. 
I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. And catch this, I will recount all of your wondrous deeds, wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. In other words, David was reminding himself of what God had done throughout history. The wonderful deeds recorded throughout Scripture. I mean, he was probably thinking of creation, relation, instruction, uh, salvation, protection, all leading up to eternity. And the events of that storyline filled his heart with gratitude, with joy and praise. And so that leads to this wholehearted thanksgiving. So what are you chewing on? What thoughts fill your mind? To build gratitude, you need to engage in the exercise of biblical meditation. Now, the next exercise that comes out in the Psalms is musical expression. Great musicians spend countless hours developing their ability. They work on scales and all sorts of exercises to to master their instrument. They practice songs over and over until they know them by heart. And yet, technical skill alone just doesn't produce great music. I mean, it requires more than just hitting all the right notes. The best performers are able to to move us because they express deep emotion through their music. David uh, just mentioned singing in that verse we read from Psalm 9. He was an exceptionally talented musician. 1 Samuel 16 tells us uh, that in his youth, he was recruited to play the lyre in the court of King Saul. And over his lifetime, we know that he composed several of the psalms as songs for worshiping God. And when the ark of God was brought into Jerusalem, he even expressed his joy through dancing. And so, though David committed some spectacular sins, he was still regarded as a man after God's own heart. I think his musical expression was a big part of that. In Psalm 69, verses 30 and 31, he said this, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hoofs. Now, when he mentions oxen and bull, he's probably referring to the Old Testament sacrifices. And there, there specifically was a, a type of sacrifice for giving thanks. It talks about it in Leviticus chapter 7. And yet David knew that the external ritual in and of itself was meaningless. It was all about the heart. And so David thought that praising God with a song would stimulate that sort of genuine thanksgiving. That's what God's looking for. So you may not have any musical ability, and that's okay. Right? But the exercise of musical expression is still an important part for you to grow in gratitude. Psalm 95 gives us this exhortation, now really calling everyone to respond, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So again, the Lord is more concerned about your heart than your musical ability. A joyful noise, as the translation there says, is better than remaining silent. We need to celebrate his character, that he is the rock of our salvation. Right? So sing or shout or, or do whatever you can to express your gratitude and praise to him with passion. If you can play an instrument, then do that for him. Psalm 33 uh, gives this exhortation. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. And 
things. Psalm 150 lists other instruments, trumpets and cymbals clashing, right? all to the praise of God. Now, the New Testament does not speak of musical expression as often as the Old Testament does, but it's still, it still gives us important insights. On three separate occasions, the book of Revelation mentions singing before the throne of God. His glorious presence elicits that kind of passionate response. So eternity will be filled with musical expression. But even now, as we, as we press on with life here, Paul calls believers to sing in response to biblical meditation. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, and then singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So some believers tend to focus on the word and neglect singing. Others sing a lot, very passionately, but may not focus on the word that much. To cultivate gratitude and to grow spiritually, we need to exercise both head and heart. Sing to the Lord. The next ex exercise is congregational participation. My wife loves campfires, and uh, so I've learned not to mess around when I need to start one. Right? I mean, if you just stuff some paper in there and light it, it just smolders or you know, doused it with lighter fluid, and it flames up big and then burns out after a few seconds without really catching. So I go to all this effort. I split wood into smaller pieces. I arrange it carefully. I put it in the paper, douse it with the lighter fluid. The whole works so that it will finally catch fire and burn. And you know how it is. Once it's going and the coals are hot, you can throw any old log in there, and it'll eventually start catch on fire. But if you pull one of those coals away from it, it, it grows cold quickly. And believers are like that. For us to stay spiritually hot, we need to be together. Interesting day to talk about that, huh? Uh, when it's so hard for some people to get here today. So the Psalms speak of congregational participation as another exercise that helps us be thankful. Psalm 111 Verse 1 says, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Now, was the psalmist thinking of something like a local church gathering here? Probably not. The Jewish practice of meeting in synagogues didn't begin uh, until uh, the Babylonian captivity or maybe afterward. The assembly here is probably uh, one of the three feasts where they would go to Jerusalem. And so with these verses, the psalmist was, was stirring up gratitude uh, in his heart on the, on the journey to make the most of the event. Faithful people from all over the country would come to the temple to celebrate Passover, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths together. Passover looked, looked back at how God saved the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt, how the, the angel brought that plague of death through the land, and, and, and they, their firstborn sons were protected because they, they killed the Passover lamb and spread its blood on their doorpost. The Feast of Weeks, or, or we often call it Pentecost, uh, was when people would offer up the first fruits of their, of their crops as an expression of, of thanksgiving and faith that God continue to provide for them. So it was very focused on the present in some sense. And then in the Feast of Booths, people would camp out in temporary shelters uh, to remember Israel's wandering in the wilderness. And at the same time, that looked ahead to the future. It, was, it communicated the idea that, that they were still waiting for the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises, His covenant promises. So a person could use those times of celebration, could even look back on them to find strength when times were hard. 
Psalm 42 demonstrates this strategy. Verses 4 and 5. It says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. Here again, that Hebrew word praise in this, con- in, in this verse could be translated as thanks. And so catch the picture. The person's heart is in turmoil. He's, he's filled with grief. But he remembers how much he enjoyed being with everyone at the festivals, going to worship the Lord. And so he argues with his own soul. He tells himself to be hopeful that, that this suffering that he's going through won't last forever. And so he makes this statement of, of faith, of aspiration, of commitment. He proclaims that he will one day give thanks to God again. We all need to challenge ourselves that way. We need that determination to give thanks. Now, later on, as Jewish people began to meet together in local synagogues, uh, congregational participation became more frequent. And that's what carries over into the early church. Acts 2 tells us that the Christians in Jerusalem were devoted to fellowship, that they were gathering day by day and breaking bread in their homes. And we don't know how long that intense focus uh, lasted, but certainly by the time Paul wrote the letter, uh, first letter to the Corinthians, it seems that the church there was gathering on the first day of the week. He mentions that in 1 Corinthians 16. So what happened when they met? Well, we just read in Colossians 3 some... Uh, a statement about that. And we find a a parallel one in Ephesians 5, uh, verses 19 and 20. Paul speaks of them addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see all three exercises combined when you take Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5, right? There's biblical meditation, there's musical expression, congregational participation, all contributing to this overall sense of thanksgiving. Every church gathering should be like that, right? But it'll never happen if it's just one person sharing the word or just a a few people performing a couple songs. Whether you're watching online or even in person, congregational observation is not the same as congregational participation, right? Remember the way that Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 talks about it? It says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. All right, the, school is, the church is not a school. It's not a business. It's not a show or a theater. It's a body. And so for, for us to be spiritually healthy, we need you. We need you to be present whenever possible. We need you to come ready to encourage others. So congregational participation builds gratitude. And one more exercise. Missional devotion. All throughout this series, I've pictured gratitude as a fire. That in and, and these exercises kind of play into that. We, uh, we seek the right fuel through biblical meditation. That's, that's like the wood. And, and we fan the flames through musical expression. We keep the coals burning hot, like we said, through 
congregational participation. But a blazing fire like that also puts out a lot of light. If it's up on a hilltop in the dark of night, it can be seen for miles. And our gratitude should shine like that. Rather than keeping it hidden, we should be open about it. It should be evident, should be overflowing. I mean, if you recognize the goodness and steadfast love of God, then isn't it natural to want other people to see that too? If we're really thankful for that, then if we recognize how good it is, we should want everyone to see it and and respond to it too. And so we need to have that mission, that purpose in view. That's the final exercise to building our gratitude. I'm calling it missional devotion. And I think David models uh, that focus in Psalm 57, verses 9 and 10. He said, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. The superscript to that psalm links it to the time that Uh, David had fled from Saul and he was hiding in the cave. 1 Samuel 24 tells us that Saul had about 3,000 men. And and yet the Lord protected David and and his much smaller group of men. Uh, Saul, unaware of their location, wandered into that cave, you may remember the story, to relieve himself. Uh, And David could have have slain Saul, but he resisted. Uh, He felt that he shouldn't do that to the the one the Lord had anointed as king. And so after that experience, this is David's response. He wanted to spread the news of God's steadfast love among all the nations and peoples of the world. Later, when David becomes king then, he exhorts all the people of Israel to join him in, in, in telling the world about God. First Chronicles 16 tells us that he brought, brought, when he brought the ark of God into Jerusalem, he appointed uh, Asaph and others as song leaders. And that chapter records, it seems like portions of, of at least what are recorded as, as other psalms in, in, in the book of Psalms. Verse 8 of 1 Chronicles 16 uh, is also found in Psalm 105.1. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. So who was responsible for making God known to the world? Not just prophets, priests, or kings. That was God's purpose for the whole nation of Israel, for all of them. He wanted them to represent him before the world as a kingdom of priests, it says in Exodus 19. And as we, we saw previously in Psalm 138, David was confident that one day all the kings of the earth would give thanks to the Lord. Now Jesus, we come to the New Testament, Jesus makes it clear that the church is to carry on that same mission, to make God known. Jesus told his followers to make disciples of all nations and to proclaim repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And come to First Peter, and Peter uses, draws upon these, some Old Testament terms like Exodus, uh, from Exodus 19, First Peter 2, verse 9. He says, but you, he's speaking to the church now, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, maybe it seems obvious to say that God's excellencies should be proclaimed in a spirit of thankfulness. That would seem to go together. But I think it's possible for us to lose sight of that. Because when we see the, the sinfulness, the darkness of the unbelieving world, there's a temptation to take pride in our spiritual efforts. Jesus talked about that kind of attitude. He told a story about a a Pharisee 
and a tax collector who went up to pray. And in Luke 18, 11, it tells us that he said, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. What a warped expression of gratitude. I mean, think about that. He, he wasn't really thanking God at all. He presents it in this pious-sounding way. But rather than shining the light on the goodness and steadfast love of God, he's, he's really turning the spotlight on himself. And he's boasting in his self-righteousness and, and looking down on the people around him. Now, if we succumb to that sort of pharisaical outlook, how do you think we'll relate to the sinful people around us? I suspect that we treat them with disgust, irritation, anger, rather than Christ-like compassion and grace. I think Paul was addressing this same problem as he wrote to the Philippians. In chapter 3 of Philippians, he, he warns them about self-righteousness. Such a powerful chapter. And in chapter 1, he talks about striving together for the faith of the gospel. And then in, in the middle, in chapter 2, is that amazing passage about the humility of Christ, calling us to be humble as well. And he follows that up in verses 14 and 15 of chapter 2 by saying... Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, I, I think the grumbling and disputing he's talking about was probably about that good and twisted generation. We know that the Philippians were facing opposition and persecution. But self-righteous grumbling doesn't, doesn't bring any light into the darkness. We have to recognize that. I mean, yes, they needed to live holy, but they needed to do so with a spirit of humility. How do we strike that balance? What's the opposite of grumbling or disputing? It's Thanksgiving, isn't it? The gospel shines as we radiate true thankfulness. And so this exercise of missional devotion keeps our Thanksgiving on track with God's purpose. It keeps us from straying into that twisted, pharisaical kind of, of thanksgiving. So in this study of gratitude, I've attempted to persuade you, first, that we need a new understanding of gratitude, that biblical gratitude is a discipline of the mind and the will, the emotions centered upon God and His saving work. And then rather than, than look to our national history or even our personal journey to fuel our gratitude, we should draw inspiration from the biblical storyline, from God's story. And then to cultivate this passionate habit, we need to use these four exercises. Biblical meditation, musical celebration, congregational participation, and missional devotion. So is that kind of gratitude present in your life? I mean, I'll say this. It's impossible to have that or to practice that apart from salvation in Christ. And we're all sinners. Our righteousness doesn't measure up. But in His grace and love, God sent His Son to provide forgiveness from sins through His death on the cross. And so if, 
If you've never done so, I invite you to receive his grace and to begin trusting in Christ as your Savior. If you want to learn more about what that relationship looks like, what uh, this life of worship and thanksgiving is, Colossians 3 would be a great place to read. And if you've already received Christ, if you're walking with the Lord, then are you filled with gratitude? I mean, we can always grow. And there's certainly the temptation to get drawn down into that grumbling and complaining. Is there one of these exercises that that you really need to focus on? One of them lacking in your life. I encourage you to make a special effort to change that. Because God's worthy. He deserves praise and thanks all the time, in all circumstances. May our hearts overflow with the thanksgiving that he deserves.